This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. Hi, welcome to a new edition of Behind the Headlines. I'm Maura Donnelly, an associate at the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Our usual host, Charlie Greenwald, is on assignment this week, but I am very fortunate to have with me Jerry Stripmatter, a board member and former legislator. Uh, so it's really nice to have you. Thank you for um, pinch hitting for Charlie this week. Thank you very much, Maura. I look forward to learning more. I think you're, uh, you're going to enjoy our conversation today. We have Mr. Gene Barr with us, the president of the Pennsylvania Chamber. Welcome, Gene. Thanks for the invite. Well, we have, a, be back. We have a lot to talk about. We love having experts like it's you a lot on. on uh, experts, so, but yeah, we always enjoy the conversation. Yeah. Well, let's let's start with some conver some discussions of the upcoming uh, elections. Sure. Um, do you have any? Do you have a you know a crystal ball? Do you have any insights? What do you think oh, is going to be did. happening? Be, yeah, <laughs> there'd be so so much demand for that if we could predict. But as you know, and both of you know, politics can be very unpredictable. I mean, who would have ever guessed Donald Trump would be elected? There were so many things that came out on that. Uh, that that were different than what the experts had predicted. To go back to your to your previous comment, we have an interesting, of course, an election here in Pennsylvania. We've got a U.S. Senate seat that's up. Mm -hmm. Senator Casey is up. We have a gubernatorial election. We have all of the state house, and we have half of the state senate that is up. And so there are a lot of seats that are up. A lot of reason to go vote. A lot of reason. There's yeah. always good reason to vote. Right. I mean, we always encourage participation, and we encourage people to learn about the candidates. I mean, engaged and informed civic, civil participation is extremely important. So people need to get out and look at this, and there's a lot of information, and there's a lot at stake at this election. And do the uh, business leaders and all, all the businesses that you represent across the state, what are they saying about the elections? What, what are they concerned about? Well, first, let's look at what the positives are, because we're in tremendous economic growth times here, much of that due to the, to the business tax cuts, the regulatory reform packages that have been put in. Yes, there's concern about trade. There's no question about that. And fortunately, the president seems to be walking that back now in terms of relative to China and some of the European Union countries, et cetera. And that's fortunate because we were tremendously concerned and our members were concerned about that. But there's a lot to like right now. We're in what, what is the, the longest or second mm -hmm. longest bull market in terms of the stock market, uh, yeah. second only to World War II. It's phenomenal mm -hmm. times. I mean, it, the the unemployment numbers are significantly low. The one thing, the labor participation rate is not good because so many people are out of the market, in many cases due to use of illegal drugs, unfortunately. So there's a lot to be thankful for here and a lot to be positive about. But as always the case with elections, there's some dark clouds on the horizon. So. Oh, well, let's talk about those let's dark clouds. talk about some dark clouds. Let's talk about some dark clouds. Name a few. Well, first <laughs> off, in, certainly in Pennsylvania, we've had dark clouds all summer with the rain. But there yes. are some other dark clouds relative to the elections. One of the things that I think certainly concerns the chamber, because, we, yes, we're the largest, uh, broadest uh, advocacy organization for business in Pennsylvania. Uh, but what that also means is that we're advocates for a system of economic freedom, the free market system, system of free enterprise. And we have four members of the Democrats, so either members of or endorsed by the Democrat Socialists of America and the respective Philadelphia and Pittsburgh chapters. There are two in Pittsburgh okay. who defeated longtime incumbents, the uh, Paul and Dom Costa. And in Philadelphia, there's one in terms of, I believe, it's Representative Bill Keller's seat. Those three are virtually certain to be elected to the State House come January 2019. No There's opponents. Either no right. opponents or very yeah. weak opponents. The fourth one is in Delaware County, and a fairly affluent part of Delaware County, interestingly, run against State Representative Chris Quinn. And when you look at what these organizations espouse, and ostensibly the candidates who have sought their endorsement, it is tremendously concerning for those people who believe that our system, the system of economic freedom that we enjoy and firmly believe has lifted more people out of poverty than any other system known to man, is certainly being attacked by what these, these folks and these organizations espouse. Right, and liberty and you know, free markets is what's, what's propelled people out of poverty Absolutely. all the time. And the but, ability but because people are so used to it, they, they use these different terms uh, really incorrectly. And I know one of those, you know, they're even advocating that the fact that they're socialists. And I know with the definition of that, it just seems really very odd that people that 
like freedom and liberty would ever say that. But what do you think about that? Well, it's, you know, that's a great point. We have a system that, that allows you to make it, the, the best decisions for you, your business, and your family right now. And um, But what we have, we have people who have talked about the fact of socialism being this panacea for everything. Uh, the reality is the U.S. is not a purely capitalistic society. I mean, we've created Social Security, we have Medicare, Medicaid, we've got safety nets for folks, we have all those things. So it's not a purely throw people out into the wind if they're not successful. We don't have that. But what these people espouse is, and if you go on their websites, and they've either done it directly or indirectly, taken the, the DSA principles, an end to private profit, communal redistribution of assets, on the Democrat Socialist of America website, they advocate free health care, free child care, free transportation, free shelter, free education, pre-K to higher education. Now, I don't know where all this money is coming from. Yeah, that's a lot of free. That's a lot of free <laughs> wow. somehow to pay for. Yeah. That's a lot of free. And in fact, some of the other things that you see, for example, the, the, the Philadelphia Democrat Socialist uh, earlier this year, they did not have a Valentine's Day party. They had a will you be my comrade party. They, oh. They have discussions about Lenin, and I don't mean John Lennon. Yeah. <laughs> I mean Vladimir. Wow. The head of the Pittsburgh Socialists said on primary election night, when they defeated the two incumbent Democrats, we're turning Pennsylvania the right shade of red. And that red is not meaning Ooh. Republican red. That wow. means Russian, communist, USSR red. Yeah. Well, she also said, I don't know if it was that night, but, you know, in relation to the, to the four candidates winning, that this was a momentous shift. Do you, do you agree with that? I'm not sure what a shift, she didn't really explain yeah, what a shift Yeah, I don't know towards. exactly what they mean a shift. <laughs> but she went on to say that this reflects a revival of the socialist-leaning economic left. Yes, I, I would, you know, on the far left, there's certainly socialist-leaning. Um, you know, there is no question about that. And I think when you look at the fact that there's ample evidence that the Russians engaged, certainly in our election two years ago, we believe it also shows ample evidence the Russians have engaged in deliberate sabotage against Pennsylvania energy industries because Russia wins if they can keep U.S. energy production down because they need to sell that from a geopolitical and an economic perspective. You also wonder how much they're still engaged in this and sowing seeds of dissent against our institutions here in this country and in this commonwealth. So I don't know exactly what shift she's talking about. I know that when it's been tried, <laughs> sort of shift. It's, never been, it's never been successful. Look at Venezuela, look at Cuba. Venezuela is absolutely an economic free fall now. They cannot feed their people. Uh, people are fleeing the country. They have inflation that is in tens of thousands percent and unbelievably. Uh, Venezuela has gone from a country that, that was doing fairly well. They then nationalized their energy production. And with all of that and other steps, they went into free fall, economic free fall. And, and going from, you know, collectivism, you know, total collectivism, yes. and away from individual, you know, liberty and freedom, you know, stifles the economy every time. And then yes. what happens is the collective, the state, in order to enforce these things, they have to put in these really strong regulations and laws to regulate everyone and then get those people working for them rather than for yourself. And that's the downfall because then people don't want to work for the collective state. They want to work for themselves and take care of their children and their children's children. Yes. And that's the exact opposite, isn't it? You know what? It's interesting you say that because in some of their writings, they do directly attack the individualist ideology, as they call it, of the United States because it undermines the collective ideology and direction. We are a nation that is founded on individual rights, on the rights of the individual and the ability of the individual to, again, make the best choice for themselves, their family, and their business and start that up. And they want to absolutely undermine that individualist ethic, that individualist ideology that not only is prevalent in this country, but on which this country was founded. So it is a direct attack on the principles of this nation. And I think anyone who looks at that ought to be tremendously concerned. The trouble is that, and this is not a knock on younger people, because they haven't seen the, the real pitfalls of, you know, of, of communism, of socialism. And I know you'll hear from the other side, well, no one's ever done it right. I don't believe that it can be done right, to be honest with you. Nothing's ever perfect. Nothing's but the ever fact perfect. Is we're as close yeah. to perfect that any other country and any other political system has come to. We've lifted people out of poverty with the system. We have no question about it. Well, we're going to have to continue this conversation sure. perhaps after the election. That'd and, be fine. And when the four um, socialist Democrats get settled in, we'll see how things are going for well, let's them. Let's hope all four don't get settled in. But 
Well, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. Yes, we <laughs> and will. And we're looking forward to your uh, conference on uh, yes. October 1st. That's what I want to talk about. Oh, Alex yeah. Trebek is coming. Alex Trebek is here. And it is Alex Trebek. It, it is, is not Will Ferrell it's not Will doing Ferrell. Alex Trebek <laughs> on Saturday Night too. Live. <laughs> I've been asked that. Yeah, we're not bringing it. It really is Alex Trebek because okay. I've talked to him. He is coming. And it's, you it's have a whole um, evening of, we uh, do. of things going we on do. there, including a gubernatorial debate. Gubernatorial debate is going to be moderated by, by Alex, Alex Trebek. Yeah. He kind of has said he's not typically publicly, very political, so this will be well. You know what? It's it's interesting because when it was first pitched by somebody on staff, was not my idea. I wasn't too keen on it because I thought it would be a little hokey. But then we find out that he has given about six and a half million dollars to his alma mater, I think it was University of Ottawa, to create this civility and public policy dialogue wow. effort. Mm -hmm. Given a million dollars to Fordham University to create. Um, low income to create assistance for low income kids to go to Fordham. He's done a tremendous amount of work in there which was surprising to me. I did not know about yeah. it. So I, it actually does tie in and it ties in with the civility award we're going to give for the second year in a row. So let's um, give the date. October, October 1st, Hershey Lodge and Convention okay. Center. And there's there's a wonderful dinner. Great dinner. Part of that. Hershey people do a Some phenomenal job. And uh, Mr. Trebrek is going to do a fireside chat before the debate. He is. I'm going to talk to him for about 20 minutes. We're going to oh, talk a little gonna, bit about uh, Jeopardy and talk a little bit about some of his other initiatives. Okay. So I'm anxious to do that. Okay. And a website where people can get additional information? www.pachamber.org. Okay. And what other surprises do you have planned for that evening? Anything well, we can't, we, we can't tell you who the recipients of the Civility Award are, but okay. we're very pleased to to have that. Tell us a little bit about the Civility Award. Well, last year we were approached by the folks who give it, Allegheny College and Governor Ridge and his organization who, who give it at the national level. And they wanted to create a Pennsylvania Award. Oh, and we nice. said, they said, we'd like to do it at your dinner because it is, in their view, the mm -hmm. premier event for business leaders and political it people. It is the premier event. It is the premier yeah. event, as you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we agreed to do that. So last year was the first year we gave it. And it's given to two people who are passionately partisan, a Republican, a Democrat, in many cases liberal, conservative, and who fight hard for their ideals, but find a way of doing it in a civil manner. So last year we gave it to T.J. Rooney, former head of the Democrat Party and a former member of the State House, and Alan Novak, former head of the oh. Republican Party, who are actually in business together and go around the state talking and working together and giving talks about politics and do it, I've seen them a number of times who do it, in a very engaging, uh, civil manner and we thought n no one better embodied that than these two people so this year we have two other great recipients and it will be announced that evening. Oh great well mm -hmm. we want to wish you the best with your thank event. You. And yes, thank you very much. And we want to thank you so much for being here again we need to have you back so that we can come back. Um, analyze what happened after the election. I will come back so it'll be inter it's always interesting to see. Yeah thank you so much Jerry. Thank you. Stay tuned for a, a second segment of Behind the Headlines. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, helping hospitals provide healing, health, and hope to communities across the state. And by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. The Pennsylvania Chamber serves as the frontline advocate for business on Pennsylvania's Capitol Hill by influencing the legislative, regulatory, and judicial branches of state government. Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, by the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation, and by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Visit pahighwayinfo.org. Welcome back. On this segment of Behind the Headlines, Jerry and I are going to be joined appropriately by the president of APSCUF, which is the Association of Pennsylvania State College and University Faculty. And also, you are also a professor at East Stroudsburg University doing political science. We can talk, uh, talk about that. So, <laughs> right. Welcome. Uh, perfect timing. We are back to school. Well, thanks for having me yeah. back again, Jerry. Yeah. Good to see you. Great too. seeing you. So, um, how is everything going with our state universities in as we head back to school this fall. Well, you know, this is a great time of year for faculty and for students. It's one of the most exciting things about being in higher education is that you start anew every uh, semester and every academic year. And I know that my colleagues are very much look looking forward to 
being refreshed with a new group of students come, who have graduated from high school and are looking to start their college careers. So it's very exciting, and I think there's exciting things happening, too. Well, like this is the time of year when uh, you know football starts, and you know, right now every football team is number one because they haven't lost any games yet, but uh, you hear a lot of cheers. And uh, we're leading the nation right now. We are number one, or, or number 50, <laughs> number 50 in uh, student debt. And that's just phenomenal. And, and those are based on numbers from 2017. In 2016, we were the second worst, but now mm -hmm. we're, we're le dead last. Right, so I mean, I think, you know, it's a very, those single stats sometimes don't tell the entire story of everything. So uh, in Pennsylvania, we have two universities which really drive up that cost. Uh, Penn State and Pitt are pretty expensive, and they're considered for the purposes of collection of data as public universities, mm -hmm. even though we in Pennsylvania consider them quasi-public universities. Mm -hmm. For the purposes of the data, they're considered public universities. And they kind of drive up those costs when we look at the overall expenses. Having said that, all you know, a university education is increasingly expensive Increasingly, the burden is being placed on students uh, to pay for that education. We, you know, we continue to see that the Commonwealth has not capped up as far as funding to the university system, mm -hmm. to our university system. Which would keep tuition lower. Which would keep yeah. tuition lower. I know that this year there was an increase uh, of, of three and a half percent uh, to our universities and, and Penn State and Pitt and Temple and Lincoln, they all got an increase as well. I know that some of those universities were able to keep their tuition flat. Ours, though, I and mean, our tuition is much lower than theirs is, so, you know, we have, you know, an increase in tuition doesn't add up to quite the same amounts of money, but nevertheless, we're looking at about $7,500 for uh, tuition and if you look at the average of our universities, it's over $8,000 uh, because of the different tuition models that they put into place. And that just covers the tuition. It doesn't cover the fees and the increasing housing costs as well. So a college education is a very expensive thing. Having said that, though, it is still a good deal. Like mm -hmm. over the course of your lifetime, study after study after study shows, you're going to benefit from a college degree. Mm -hmm. You'll make up that debt. But I do think that we're hurting not just a generation by having those increased costs and burdening their lives in ways that uh, previous generations have not been burdened. But I also think we're hurting our own economy as well because when students have that much debt, they're obviously not spending. They're not putting money back into the economy mm -hmm. in the way that they were. And I also think it hurts disproportionately certain areas of the Commonwealth too. So in those regions of the Commonwealth where we do have some universities, but they're in poorer areas of the Commonwealth, every time that increase goes up, it disproportionately affects them. You have fewer students who are able actually to afford to be able to go to school. So when we're looking at schools like Mansfield and Clarion and Edinburgh and California, we're, you know, we're looking at regions where in fact it is quite expensive. And, uh, for those students, I think it's a bigger burden. Right, and, and for the state legislators who are responsible for you know, increasing you know, that, that giving, it's great that they were able to give some, but I think we do need to look at it as a workforce development tool, you know, because your 14 colleges and universities now are spread throughout the, the Commonwealth, and as you pointed out, a couple of them are in, in regions where we need more workforce development. The jobs that are out there for our students, that will make, make it up, you know, two, three times right. uh, by going to Mansfield, uh, they need to be supplemented now, you know, in order that we can, you know, reap that later. Isn't that true? Absolutely, and, you know, and there's, I think there's a lot of things, uh, you know, my colleagues tend to focus on the academics because by nature that's, job. <laughs> that's what their jobs are, but there's room even within the academics to appreciate both our relationship with businesses in, in the Commonwealth uh, but also to look at a college education and what does it mean. It hasn't escaped our attention that as certain jobs have changed over the years, become more tech, uh, technological, require different skills like math and the rest, we, perhaps we need to rethink what it is that we're doing and the degrees that we offer too. So it's, 
you know, even when you look at a job like auto mechanic now, it requires yeah. so much knowledge that we ought to be thinking, is that, are we moving to a place where you should perhaps be able to get a Bachelor of Science degree, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in that with some business skills and other skills mm -hmm. too, in order to be able to, uh, to, to, to both educate our pop the population and do our jobs, uh, benefit, I think, uh, businesses as well when we look at uh, machinists, which mm -hmm. again is another skill that has become much more complicated. And particularly in those, at those universities where we've seen some decline in enrollment, right? It makes mm -hmm. all the sense in the world mm -hmm. to be looking at what is it that you're doing, uh, what surrounds you, are there uh, uh, career technical centers that the high schools have, and if they're not there, can you fill in and help mm -hmm. even at the high school level to do some of those roles? So I, I think that there's a lot of exciting things that are out there. Uh, you know, it's uh, we haven't talked about it for a long time, but there's you know there's some room for some economic development zones too, mm -hmm. particularly mm -hmm. at these universities mm -hmm. which are in uh, regions of the Commonwealth where, again, you have there's a real need to bring business and industry there. And if we start to look at our universities as what they are which are really, you know, resources. Uh, instead of looking at them as a drain, but to look at how can we maximize the degree to which they're resources. Yeah, it, it's best out. to use those universities uh, to take care of the gaps that are there between high school and, and the job site. So that's another burden that you have that then ups the cost of about amount of time and, and what you can do. So yeah, you're a great resource that really should be recognized more. Yeah, you're, a, you're absolutely correct. And I, I think people are wrong when they tend to look at it as sort of like a zero sum situation. If you talk about technology, then you're ignoring humanities. That's mm -hmm. not true if you're running mm -hmm. things appropriately yeah, there's room for everyone, right? Nobody ever complains. I don't think they do complain much if there's a philosophy department of foreign languages at a mm -hmm. university has got 100,000 students, you know, mm -hmm. that's blossoming, mm -hmm. right? It's when things get tight that we start to look for what are we going to shed. Um, and so I do think that there's a lot of opportunities out there and, uh, you know, and even in the humanities, you were mm -hmm. talking about that and I mentioned philosophy, mm -hmm. which might get a bad rap for things, but philosophy majors get jobs. And they get jobs. I loved philosophy. Well, they get jobs specifically <laughs> if you look yeah. at what what skills are required in philosophy, right? Think critically, write yeah, well. Exactly. I, you know, Plato had a lot of good yeah. ideas and a lot of good yeah. points yeah. that a lot of people have forgotten today. But even even, even yeah. as far as training mm -hmm. and skills go, mm -hmm. you're getting the kinds of skills yeah. that actually, if you look at what CEOs are saying, it's what you think. Those are the skills that they say they want in mm -hmm. employees, and that's sometimes the bad rap that the liberal arts and humanities get because. Unlike other fields, you can't always show the direct path right. to what the job is. But the you know the bottom line is, if you have a college degree and, and this bears itself out in studies that are shown, and if you have a get a degree and you're ambitious and you look for jobs, there are a lot of opportunities. Mm -hmm. It may not be the exact thing that you thought you were going to do, but you'll you'll do you'll get a job and you will do well over the course. You probably of have twenty the jobs by the time you're finished. <coughs> really, they, you, you might. Your students now might yeah. have 20 careers. You might. Things are, you know, things change rapidly, and and that's one of the benefits of getting a degree in the liberal arts and the humanities is that you are adaptable, uh, and you know how to think mm -hmm. critically, and you have skills that are transferable from uh, one position to another position. There is some good news out there, and uh, believe it or not, it's not news. all about the debt, but. Um, Parents have been surveyed and asked whether, even though there's a, you know, it's a rising cost and everything, whether they still view college as a good investment, and overwhelmingly they do, which is, you know, it, it doesn't help, the, you know, reduce the debt, but at least there's support behind sending kids to get degrees and. Over the years, we've consistently seen that that the students who go to our universities, that their parent parents looking into the future understand that it, it is a good uh, investment for them. I, I sometimes, uh, you know, I cringe a little bit when I hear sometimes some business leaders saying, oh, you've got to direct students away from college to go and to explore other options. Well, I, I think we ought to leave it up to the students mm -hmm. about what they want to do with their lives, but we need to present all the options to them. They may to need to make wise choices, mm -hmm. but certainly any student who uh, meets the admission standards for a university should have the opportunity to attend that university if it's a public university, right? So it should be affordable. They should have that opportunity. 
because I think that parents know, they may not know the exact statistics, but they know deep down the impact that a college education has on someone's mm -hmm. life. That, again, they are likely to make more money, much more money over the course of their mm -hmm. lifetimes. And on top of that, they're likely to have a different view of the world. If you've gone through that college experience, if you've been challenged, we widen your horizons as well. And we think it even has you know, impacts for, even if you don't wind up in college, uh, in a career, if you're just rearing children, like it makes a difference mm -hmm. that you've had various different experiences. It's a great asset you know, that, that you present to the Commonwealth and all the families here. But a lot of times when people look at it, they look, oh, I want the very best you know, for my child. Rather mm -hmm. than looking at the long haul, they look at, at different colleges, universities that aren't related to the, go to the government. Right. And the fact that as, as government you know, legislators don't want to have advertising, don't want to do those things. So you're, you're taking a back seat to that. So we're happy you're on, on today. So our, right. our show goes all across the Commonwealth that they can see that this is really a, a great asset and a great deal for families that they don't get to see because we, the legislators don't want to have you spending money on advertising as these other uh, other colleges do that spend more you know spend more of your money on advertising than teaching as you do. Right. So I, I think that those people ought to talk to our alumni and mm -hmm. uh, if you spend time on our campuses and if you talk to the alumni, what well, you'll understand, what everybody will understand is that the story of our, our state system is actually the story of success. Mm -hmm. That on every single one of our campuses, there are amazing things happening. Students are learning, students are succeeding. And whether that's at our largest school, Westchester, or at the smallest school, Cheney University, mm -hmm. we have students who are doing well and moving on. And that's why this is a, such an exciting time of year, because yeah. we see these students coming in as high school students, and we know that they're going to leave being successful. Well, in our last minute, I can't believe it's we're already down to our last minute. You know, you work a lot on college affordability and student debt. What else are you interested in as this school year starts? Well, I do want to mention the Pennsylvania Promise. Uh, and this is something that has been introduced in the legislature. Uh, which tries to make college more affordable, particularly for those families who are below $110,000 a year. It'll impact, uh, it would impact students going to the state-related universities, uh, students who go to our university, students who go uh, to community college. And we, what we really want to do and what we like to see is let's start having that conversation. We know we may not be successful in getting this legislation through, mm -hmm. uh, but we also know that it benefits everyone and it, and it even benefits students who wouldn't qualify for this program because if more students were going to the universities, if they were higher enrolled, obviously their fixed costs uh, you know, get to be covered by more students and that way they could keep their, their tuitions down. That's too. great. Well, I want, we want to thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, mm -hmm. We appreciate the conversation. We, we look forward to having you back. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure. Good well, to see you. Yes, thank you so much. And we will see you next time on Behind the Headlines. Mm -hmm.